in my paper's title, I have included two terms which were most used in interchange polemic and Ukrainian social and religious discourse for nearly 30 years. Uh, from time to time, it provoked even mocks on the side of the broader Ukrainian society. And sometimes it deserved that mocking because often churches in Ukraine were concentrated around secondary issues. I want to contextualize the, the issue of autocephaly to the uh, events of uh, 2013 and 2014 uh, because the revolution of dignity uh, revealed the real problems and desires of Ukrainian society uh, and it w was also telling in religious context, especially concerning the state, church relations and interchurch dialogue. The revolution of dignity has a cons considerable impact on the religious life in Ukraine and I'm convinced that granting of the autocephalous dignity to the OCU is also one consequence of it. It was one more revolution of dignity because it restored millions of Ukrainians in their Christian dignity within the world orthodoxy. All these events, I guess, should motivate Ukrainian churches to turn the page of the previous period and to look beyond past horizons. Both the OCU and the UGCC will play very important roles in Ukrainian society in the coming decades. They should conduct a lot of mutual initiatives. I'm convinced that the ecumenical atmosphere in the whole region depends on the development of the relations between two churches. I guess today we need to turn the page, as I said, and to close all issues. Both churches now are Ukrainian and canonical. By using the term canonical, I mean that this or that church is recognized as a legitimate ecclesiological reality within its glo glo global community, Catholic or Orthodox respectively. As for the term Ukrainian, I mean not merely the ethnic or national feature of the church, but that it is not a structural part of another local or pomisna church. It is a part of its global Catholic or Orthodox community with no intermediaries. That doesn't mean that these churches shouldn't cooperate with the other churches. The cooperation and deepening of relations is necessary with other dynamic, dynamic communities in Ukraine, Roman Catholics, which during the last few years renewed its episcopate. And it worth mentioning that all new bishops belong to the younger generation of priests born in Ukraine and with Protestants and with the Church of Moscow Patriarchate. But this is another topic. Here I will stop only on the relations between OCU and the UGCC. To some extent, these relations are marked with a phenomenon called the past, de a past dependence and conditioned by the trajectory of the previous period. The religious revival in Ukraine in the late 1980s led to the emergence from the underground of the UGCC as well as a restoration of the Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church, but was accompanied by many interchurch conflicts and not only about the property. Those conflicts took place simultaneously and within the context of national liberation and therefore each of the denominations wanted to play the role of leader of spiritual libera liberator or spiritual leader of spiritual liberation from the colonial center. This competition continued with different uh, levels of intensity throughout all previous decades of Ukrainian history. Only after finishing the acute conflict phase in the first half of the 1990s, the, relations, the relationship between the UGCC and the Ukrainian Docephalus Orthodox jurisdictions improved and they started to interact at different levels. Starting from the mid-1990s, in comparison with the Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate and Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church rarely accused the UGCC in proselytizing on their canonical territory. To a certain extent, this was because the basic parish network of Autocephalous movement was concentrated, and partly it is still so, in those regions where the UGCC also holds strong positions. 
In the rest of Ukraine, except, of, except for Walling, uh, where the position of Kiev and Patriarchate was strong enough and the UGCC has had only, and still has, only more than a modest exarchate, the UGCC and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate or Autocephalous Church were minorities, often negatively treated by the local allies. This period was also a time when each church developed its own ecumenical approach toward the other. The UGCC based its ecumenical doctrine on the ideas of metropolitans Josef Wilhelmin Rutsky, Andrei Sheptitsky, and Josef Slipy. According to it, the restoration of the unity of the Kievan church should start with the mutual movement of all the branches, heirs of, the, of St. Volodymyr's baptism toward, toward each other without loss of canonical ties with those church centers with which this or that church maintains them. Essential in this context was the letter of his beatitude Lubomir Huser dated April 28, 2008, which he sent to Metropolitan Volodymyr Sabodan, at that time the primate of Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow, Patriarchate. So he, he sent a letter with a proposal of creation of the Council of Churches of St. Volodymyr's Baptism. In the very core of the ecumenical doctrine of the Ukrainian Greco Catholic Church was the proposal to reject the exclusivist approach to the legacy of Kievan Christianity. Due to the position of Ukrainian Greco Catholic Church primate, none of the Ukrainian churches which derive their roots from the St. Volodymyr baptism should, should not claim exclusive rights on it. Based on such approach, the UGCC tried to stay remote toward the inter Orthodox discussions in Ukraine and build equal and friendly relations with all three Orthodox churches, despite the division between them. Nevertheless, Greco Catholics were able to develop good relations only with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate and Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Autocephalous Orthodox Church. Because with these churches, they shared a common position on the social, cul social cultural, and political vector of development of Ukraine. But these relations have never had an official or systematic character. The leaders of the Ukrainian Autocephalous Churches met ecumenical initiatives of Ukrainian Greco-Catholics with a little enthusiasm. In his letter to Lubomir Huzar on behalf of Synod of Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate, then Patriarch Filaret voiced sincere openness toward the cooperation on social and moral issues for the good of the Ukrainian society, but expressed his doubts on the possibility of talks about the unity until the UGCC wouldn't return to the situation before 1596. Nevertheless, those answers never sounded as sharp as similar reactions of the representatives of the Moscow Patriarchate. The reaction concerning the transfer of the UGCC head's office to Kyiv from Lviv was very moderate. At the time, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kyiv and Patriarchate stated that it was an internal affair of the UGCC where its center should be. One reason for such a tolerant approach toward the UGCC on the side of the autocephalous churches was their forced isolation from the rest of the Christian world. Kievan Patriarchate used any contacts with the Roman Catholic Church and Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church to at least partially overcome it. This could be exemplified by the meeting of the head of Kievan Patriarchate with Pope John Paul II in 2001 as well as the official request from the Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate to the UGCC asking for an official position on the validity of the sacrament of baptism in the Kievan Patriarchate in 2012, on which the head of Greco-Catholics answered positively. The process of the healing of the canonical status of the Ukrainian autocephalous movement that ended up with the Unifying Council and the promulgation of the Thomas of Autocephaly for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine in early 19, uh, 2019 was posi positively evaluated in the UGCC. After the official granting of Thomas to the OCU, the head of the UGCC called it, a quote, a historic event that, uh, th that our society was waiting for. On the official level, the ground for this assessment was primarily pastoral and ecumenical. 
Because on the one hand, millions of Ukrainian Christians, through the recognition of the canonical status of their church, have returned to the Eucharistic unity with the Church of Constantinople and in an indirect way with other churches. On the other hand, the official recognition of the OCU by the Ecumenical Patriarchate allows launching an official ecumenical dialogue between the UGCC and the Ukrainian Autocephalous Church. Also, the emergence of the canonical Autocephalous Church in Ukraine can contribute to the reinvigoration of the ecumenical dialogue on the universal level. The basic configuration of which was formed at the time of the Soviet Union and took place without the consideration of diversity of the Eastern Christianity in Central and Eastern Europe for obvious reasons. And the leading monopoly was by default granted to the Moscow Patriarchate, which gained a privilege to speak on behalf of the whole region. Beyond these arguments, it was clear that most Greco-Catholics supported the autocephaly of Ukrainian Orthodoxy, since it was, and still is, a state security issue. Russian state authorities are actively using the religious factor or weaponizing the religious factor in its hybrid warfare against Ukraine. Thus, the attempts of the Ukrainian president to construct an adequate defense in this sector were posi positively evaluated by most of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholics. The position of the UGCC found positive feedback on the side of the autocephalous churches, although it was clear that having started the process of normalization of their canonical status, they would distance themselves from the UGCC. First of all, it was due to the constant accusations of the Moscow Patriarchate that the project of Ukrainian autocephaly will end up with a new UNIA. At a recent meeting in Amman, Patriarch Kirill, again, stated that among the negative consequences of acts of Constantinople in Ukraine is that, quote, the unionism is holding up its head. The UGCC, on its part, had some fears that the new autocephalous church, after receiving Thomas, and supported by the president and Ukrainian government, would want to copy the Russian church model, where all religious communities are equal, but some are more equal than the others. The response of the OCU on the wish of the Greco-Catholics to hold a solemn service in the St. Sophia Cathedral in Kiev, the church, which has a central symbolic significance to all Ukrainian churches of Eastern Byzantine tradition, testified that after receiving the Thomas, the OCU would insist on its unique role in Ukraine and exclusive rights on the legacy of Kievan Christianity. The controversy that surrounded that event ended with the intervention of the state authorities and was regarded by the UGCC as a justifying their fears. Although the formal reason for refusing the service of the UGCC in St. Sophia was a restoration work, it was clear that it was clear to everyone that this was just an explanation that should have helped uh, everyone to keep their faces. After all events, the head of the UGCC stated that he didn't understand why the desire of Greco-Catholics to hold worship in St. Sophia of Kiev could lead to tensions in Ukrainian society, as representatives of the OCU expressed it. In his view, tensions could be caused by claims of exclusive rights on the national shrine by one of the churches. Finally, the UGCC has not withdrawn its desire to hold worship in St. Sophia of Kiev in the future. The possibility of tensions within the Ukrainian society concerning the worship in St. Sophia of Kiev seemed far-fetched in the light of the statistics of religious activity in Ukraine. Only 10-15% of Ukrainians are actively involved in the life of their churches and are interested in church affairs. On the contrary, within the socially active segment of Ukrainian society, especially after the events of the Revolution of Dignity, there is a request for peaceful coexistence of different religions and denominations. A certain intrigue in the context of granting of the autocephaly to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine was the question of reaction of individual parishes and faithful of the UGCC on it. As mentioned above, at the grassroots level, the autocephaly of Ukrainian Orthodoxy was perceived by the faithful of the, U faithful of the UGCC as an element of state security. However, as far as I know, 
During summer and autumn 2018, faithful from different Greco-Catholic parishes were asking their priests about the meaning and consequences of the autocephaly for the UGCC, and these inquiries were delivered to the bishops. Thus, this issue has been the subject of discussions at various level meetings. Bishops of the UGCC have been concerned about the possible transition of problematic parishes or priests, and one or two such cases have taken place already. President Petro Poroshenko's speech during the mass, a mass pilgrimage to Zarvanitsia in summer 2018, where he once again devoted a significant part of his speech to the issue of photocephaly, also caused some outrage among Greco-Catholic bishops and priests. To my knowledge, in previous decades, um, the idea of Ukrainian autocephaly, if raised in the Russian Orthodox Church, was always considered closely with the Uniate issue. That is, whether the granting of the autocephaly to the Ukrainian Church would facilitate the conversion of Greco-Catholics to the Orthodox Church. There was an example of Romania, where only a small part of former Greco-Catholics returned to the Romanian Greco-Catholic Church after its revival. And one of the reasons for that was the existence of an autocephalous Romanian Orthodox Church. The Russian Orthodox Church tends to regard the UGCC as merely a nationalistic, pro nationalistic project, and so there was some hope that the emergence of an independent church in an independent state may encourage Greco-Catholics to convert. By certain inertia, such assumption existed in Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church and in Kievan Patriarchate, but they did not force this process or agitate for it. Moreover, after the Tomos, leaders of two churches have held a series of brief meetings, which have shown that they, at least on the declarative level, do not want, to con do not want confrontation, but a deepening of relations. Despite the absence of transitions from UGCC to the OCU, the question remains whether the official recognition of the autocephaly of Orthodox Church in Ukraine challenged the identity of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church and its positioning within the Ukrainian society. To some extent, yes. Both the granting of Thomas and the controversy surrounding the liturgy in St. Sophia of Kiev became triggers for the renewal of a reflection within the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church concerning its identity and the future relations between two churches. On January 24, 2019, on the occasion of the Centenary of Unification Act, the head of U the UGCC issued a message, Our Saint Sophia, in which he presented a look at the past and present of Ukrainian Christianity, as well as the place, as well as the look on the place of the UGCC in it. This message, in fact, an example of positioning of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church in the post-Thomas reality in Ukraine. The message continues the line of his predecessors, um, of his Beatitudes, uh, Lubomir Huzar and uh, Sheptitsky and Slepy also, and emphasizes the open character of Ukrainian Christianity both toward Western, toward, towards Western and Eastern Christian culture. St. Sophia Cathedral, in opinion of the head of the UGCC, is, quote, to this day a symbolic symbol of the primary integrity and completeness of the one and indivisible Kievan Church. Thus, all churches of Volodymyr's baptism are equal heirs, heirs of that heritage, and the role of the UGCC is a testimony of undivided Christianity, and martyrdom of our times. The head of the UGCC once again suggested to abandon the exclusivist approach toward Ukrainian Eastern Christian heritage. Although this message was addressed to the whole Ukrainian society, it was evident that it was primarily related to the OCU. It appeared shortly after the official granting of the Thomas and some active efforts on the part of the OCU to receive exclusive rights to hold the services in St. Sophia of Kiev, or even to get it as its central cathedral. During the spring 2019, the political situation in Ukraine has changed dramatically, and the new government distanced itself from the policy of the previous state authorities, including in the religious sphere. 
That again brought the Ukrainian religious situation back to the previous status quo with a significant difference. The existence of a new autocephalous Orthodox Church was already a fact, which was reinforced by her recognition by two influential churches, Greek and Alexandrian. The first year of existence of, o of the OCU testified that this church was able to overcome the first and quite critical period, period of its existence, despite obstacles including generated by the former head of the Kievan Patriarchate Metropolitan Filaret. In the context of the relationship between the OCU and the UGCC, the speech given by his Beatitude Epiphany during the celebration marking the first anniversary of the granting of Thomas is significant. In a certain sense, it can be placed in a row with the message of his Beatitude Sviatoslav, our Saint Sophia, as it is also an example of positioning of the church in a post-Thomas Ukrainian reality. Metropolitan Epiphany appeals to the whole Ukrainian society. This is a very important point. But what draws attention is that he speaks of his church as if there were no other churches in Ukraine. When he moves his attention outside of the OCU, he states that in the history of Ukraine it is difficult to find an institution more attuned to the Ukrainian people than the autocephalous Ukrainian church. Referring to the high level of trust in the church in Ukrainian society, he again doesn't mention that this trust is the merit of various religious communities present in Ukraine, paradoxically. According to the latest sociological data from the Razumkov Center for 2019, this is annual report, Metropolitan Epiphany is trusted by 39% of Ukrainians, while Pope Francis is trusted 42. I'm not greater Catholic than the Pope, uh, but this data would need more in-depth analysis, of course, but they show that the collective trust in the church in Ukraine consists of many layers and cannot be assigned to one of the churches or religious denominations. Finally, Metropolitan Epiphany addressing the whole Ukrainian society didn't say in any way how the church headed by him would build his relation, its relation with other churches and religious communities and in particular with UGCC, including the overcoming of specific social challenges and problems of Ukraine where different Catholic and Protestant communities are already involved. It is clear that today the OCU is still in its making and its main priority in the current moment is proving to the other Orthodox churches that it possesses a leading position within Ukraine. After the recognition by the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the autocephalous movement in Ukraine does not need Greco-Catholics to overcome its isolation anymore. On the contrary, contacts with Uniates can have a substantial negative impact on the recognition process, so the headship of the OCU will be keeping the distance toward the UGCC. The latter can treat this with proper understanding. However, the reaction to the exclusivist tendencies will be negative. Summing up, we can say that today the UGCC and the OCU are in the process of developing mechanisms of interaction that depend to some extent on past developments and positions. Various statements of his Beatitude Svetoslav indicate that the UGCC would like to have more intensive dialogue. It seeks the broadest possible involvement of the new church in official ecumenical dialogue at the local and global levels both to improve interchurch relations in Ukraine and to revive the ecumenical movement as a whole. During his meeting with Patriarch Bartholomew in Rome, his Beatitude Sviatoslav noted that Thomas opened the door for the start of the official ecumenical dialogue in Ukraine, which was not possible before because of the uncertain canonical status of Autocephalus Church and Kievan Patriarchate. On December 5th, 2019, the OCU created a Synodal Commission for Inter-Christian Relations, which is still working on its Charter of Strategy. It's interesting that at least a half of the Commission are, is formed, are former clerics and laymen of the uh, Moscow Patriarchate that were famous for their pro-ecumenical position before and were involved in different formats 
of the ecumenical dialogue in Ukraine and abroad. Considering the proportion of former members of the Moscow Patriarchate within the OCU, it is quite a remar remarkable fact. In some way, it shows that the artificial isolation of former Kievan Patriarchate and Autocephalous Church that lasted more than 25 years made them unprepared for the serious ecumenical relations. They don't have enough specialists, and I would say enthusiasts, for it. It is understandable that OCU will today, as I said before, pay more attention to the relations with the other Orthodox churches. And its main goal for the next few years is to gain the broadest recognition. But it, this doesn't remove from the agenda the question of relations between different Ukrainian churches, including U UGCC. The new church will have to build its policy toward, the, toward other churches with respect to the nuances of Ukrainian history and reality. Both present not only challenges, but also opportunities, I'm convinced, and not only for the future of Christianity in Ukraine, but can also have a broader impact. Thank you.